putting it together. Uh, let me just also say, in case you are a first-time guest of ours today, we don't have what, we, what, what is known as closed communion. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the, uh, the responsibility is upon you, not upon the church. It says, let every man examine himself. In other words, if you want to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us, feel free to receive it with us and take it with us when we take it together at the end of the service. We welcome you be a part of it. The preference is that you know the Lord and you're walking with the Lord and you're enjoying Jesus. Amen? Well, you know, this is Firecracker Week, what some people call it, but it's much more than that. It is a celebration of our liberties and our freedom, the establishment of this great American nation, 242 years, I believe now, old, almost old as crystal, amen? <laughs> <laughs> so as we celebrate it, you know, uh, we need to understand that how this nation was founded. I think it's fitting that on this Sunday, we take the Lord's Supper. And I say that for several reasons. One, uh, I don't believe that this nation would have ever survived this long had it not been for the supernatural sovereignty, providence of God. And I believe because of its foundation and the roots of which it's deeply planted in, of in God we trust is the main reason because of that. We all know that the nation's certainly moving away from that in God we trust uh, uh, motto and line, and it's becoming just something that's emblematic on a, on a, on a bill. But understand that our founding fathers knew very clearly what, uh, what the goal and the passion and the desire was when this nation was put together and the Constitution was written. It was a, a, to be established in Christ and through Christ and experience of freedom. Those people fled the persecution, the oppression of the Church of England as well as other European nations to get away from being told you know, how they could worship and when they could worship and what could go on. I mean, in our freedom, we had the ability to come here this morning amen, and are not even, <laughs> to, to worship the Lord and to celebrate this day. So I want to keep in mind that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, we remember Him. But remember, if it were not for the basic principles of Scripture and of freedom that God grants to men, the, that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that doesn't come out of just the air. I believe there's a biblical principle found in those things of what it really means to be free. And those great people seeking that freedom made that decision to, to come. They'd already discovered the freedom of Christ, but they wanted to express that freedom in a very realistic, real way in their own physical lives. So we celebrate today, and we also celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. It once was said that if we are to gain freedom, we will not gain it until we have paid the full price. I think it's understandable that there's no freedom without a sacrifice. There's no freedom without commitments, and there's no freedom without a price. It never, by the way, comes cheap either. It's a, there's, a, there's a price that, that is usually paid. Uh, if we look at the history of America alone in itself, prior to 1900, there were probably over a million deaths lost in battles. Uh, after 1900, with World War I, there were 117,000 American lives lost. Half a million in World War II gave their lives to, to, to have freedom and to expand that freedom to other places in the globe. 37,000 lives lost in the Korean conflict, another 58,000 in Vietnam and thousands of others upon other conflicts that we've had since those major conflicts. Freedom it results from sacrifice, and sacrifice never comes without commitment. Our nation understands that if freedom is going to be maintained, it requires commitment. Soldiers, our military understands that if, ma that if our freedom is going to be maintained, it requires sacrifice and it requires commitment. Even as we look at our own Christian faith, we have freedom through Christ because of a sacrifice and because of commitment. But let me go on to say, you experience that freedom that you have in Christ through your own commitments to Jesus Christ. You'll continue to experience freedom in this nation by making strong commitments. You can't just sit around and let everybody go do whatever they're gonna do because when people are left in the majority pretty much to do whatever they wanna do, well, when there is no vision, the people are exposed and the people are defeated. And so what we need is an understanding again of freedom. I believe it was a story of a Vietnam veteran, young man who was going off to war, tell, telling his mother as he departed, mom, he says, you know, freedom has a price, but whatever that price is, we have to be willing to pay it. That young man never came home. That mother understood the price of our freedom. We should remember those things in times like this. Or was it the Vietnam vet came back with a saying that it was pretty simple, all gave some and some gave all. And some have given all. 
but one gave his all for us. That's one thing we should always remember as we come to this time of celebration of our, of our country. I want you to stand with me this morning as we read the Word of God together. Uh, it's on the screen. It's from Matthew 19. We're going to look at a few verses, uh, starting with verse 16, and we'll read through verse 21 as we look at this passage. You might be thinking right off the bat, well, this is about the rich young ruler. What's it have to do with freedoms and stuff? But listen carefully. I think, I think you'll get the t gist of the message. And behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. And if you would enter life, keep the commandments. Catch this. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you don't murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you honor your father, your mother, love your neighbors yourself. And the young man said to him, well, I've kept all these, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, all the, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, give to the poor, you shall have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. Amen and amen. You may be seated. As we honor the Word of God by standing like that, I think it's important that we catch some real quick points off of this. Here's this young man. He wants freedom. He realizes that he doesn't. It's like Nicodemus who comes by night. This guy doesn't come by night. He comes openly and publicly. And obviously he's a good guy. I mean, if he's telling the truth here, that he's pretty much tried to seek to keep the commandments. I mean, he hadn't stolen. But the, 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 he just got it completely all wrong, like so many people do in, in the world that we live in today, when it comes to this issue about eternal life, what must I do is the question. And they're still asking that question. Well, just what is the right thing to do if I'm going to, if I'm going to have eternal life or if I'm going to get to heaven? The, the question is, what, what good deed, what is that one good deed that I must do to have eternal life? Now, is asking the question, if you follow his, his thought through, you say, well, he's thinking about right things. And so Jesus tells him the basic commandments and goes over them again. And he says, well, I've done this. And what's, that, what's the other thing? <laughs> that Obviously, he hasn't experienced any freedom. He hasn't experienced any life. You know, well, I've been a good guy. But what else, what else needs to be, here it is, done? What, what, what is it that I need to do? Isn't it interesting? He'd fall right into the trap of every false religion in the world, but they'd automatically give him some steps to take, whether it's shave his head, grow a ponytail, whatever it might be, sell rice cakes on the street. They'd have something that they'd have him do real quick. You know, you've got to come to this and be a part of that and take this and say that and, you know, count these beads and whatever it might be, you know, join our commune, whatever. They're just looking for something to do because we know that obviously something's missing in our life. The problem Jesus tells him right off the bat, but he still keeps probing, hey, there's none good. Why, why do you ask me about good? You know, there's only one good. In other words, how can that which is not good do anything good? You can't. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that all have what? Sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Words, we, we don't meet the standard. We've always come short of the deal. We're not good enough to do what needs to be done. And so Jesus is, gets, does a little probing here because he sees his heart. And he tells him, here's what you need to do. He says, you know, you, you, well, you, you're on a good start here. If you really want to get it right, you go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Now, understand, that's not the way to get to heaven, and that's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, Jesus has already made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that, hey, if we'll give, then it'll be given back to us. And if we give then we'll be making investments by placing our treasure in where? Heaven, where moth and rust are not corrupt. So that, that's a lesson that's good for everybody. We ought to realize the importance of giving, amen, and, and putting our treasure in heaven. But Jesus looks and he sees something a little clear about this young man that I don't think he's ready to see about himself, but he gets to the point when he starts talking about, you know, well, what, what do I still lack and what else do I do? Here, here's the way to get saved. It's at the end of the verse. Here it is. Once you go deal with that, then come follow me. <laughs> come follow me. And it's really an issue of repentance. What he's going to have to turn his back on, where his love is, what his attractions are. I'm going to give you a real short sermon today. So everybody say amen. amen. And then we'll receive the Lord's Supper together. It's really simple, three points. The first point is, is a statement. The second point will be a question. And then we'll come back to a, another statement. 
All right, so it, it doesn't follow the, the original line of most outlines, so get over it if you're looking for a theology, theology lesson this morning, all right? But it's all theology. One simple point is, first statement is this, read it with me, good is never, let's do it again. Good's never good enough. That's what Jesus is making the point here. It's just not good enough. No matter what you do, you keep the commandments. You can't, by the way, because you're not good enough to be good, all right? So good's not good enough because Jesus made it clear that there's no one that's really, really good enough because everybody sinned, as we said before. I think what the question is, okay, which one of these do I do? I mean, in other words, what's the easiest way in? <laughs> What's the, what, what, which one's essential? Which one do I have to do? All right? That's the one I need to know about. Whatever that one is, we'll get that down. You know, Christians still use that mindset. We look at the Bible. We say we're under grace. We say, all right, I don't mind doing this, this, and this. Read my Bible and pray. I don't want to witness. And I, I don't mind coming to church, but I don't want to give. You know? And then you kind of go through the list. It's a, you're, you're just like this rich young ruler. You know? Which of these do I have to do? Which one's essential? And there's churches filled with a lot of people today who, who are really trying to be good just enough. What's good enough? What, what gets me over the line? You know, what gets me in the door? Sorry. You can't do it on your own. There's, no, there's nothing you can do. Something has to be done before you. We look at the Lord's Supper. We clearly see the, a picture and symbols of what had to be done. The body and the blood of a spotless sacrifice for us. Because ju good, just not good enough, all right? The second point I said would be a question, all right? The question is this. Say it with me. What are you holding? One more time. Y'all are doing really good today. We all do this every Sunday like this. <laughs> what are you holding on to? Look at this rich young ruler. What's he holding on to? What's he holding on to? He's on to his wealth. It's important to him. That's... His philosophy of life rotates around that, that symbol of money. If I have this, I can be happy. If I, if, I, if I have enough money, if I have the right house, I have the right clothing, I have the right transportation, all that, then I'll be happy. Boy, that's a whole lot of where the world we're living is now, isn't it? It's just all about I don't really want to let go of anything, you know? And he's holding on, obviously. Maybe you ought to ask it like this. What's holding on to you? What's got a hold of you? What's got its claw in you? What is it that, just, that, that, is, that you just don't think, I just, I love God, but I really don't want to let go of this. I, I can't let go of this. I, I'm not going to let go of this. Y'all heard about that. I may have used this illustration years ago, but I always thought it was pretty depictive and uh, illustrative of, of, uh, of this picture. You, you, and, and when, when, they, when they hunt monkeys, you know, in Africa, or those tribes that still hunt monkeys and eat them, they take a gourd and they... Make sure that it's attached firmly to a rope or chain to the ground so they, the monkey can't just come get the gourd and run off with it. And they stuff it full of fruit, all right? And the monkey sees the gourd full of fruit, and he shoves his hand down in there, and he gets a big old handful, but he can't get his hand back out with his, when it was closed around the fruit. Now, if he lets go, he can pull it right out. But he won't let go. All night long, he'll sit there trying to get that fruit out of that gourd. Ugh. You know, with getting all four monkey feet up there, whatever it is. Just spasm, spasms, just trying to pull it out and tear that fruit out of that gourd. He'll go through hours trying to get it out. Sunrise comes, the hunter comes with his club and his bag. He comes up, you, you know, knocks the monkey dead. Bam! Monkey's freaking out when he sees him coming, but he won't let go. Can't let go. Got my hand on the fruit. I can't let go. And it cost him his life. Collect the monkey, pull his hand out of the gourd, put him in a bag. That is such a clear picture of where so many people are. They live in such bondage, attached to whatever that thing is. Come on, this, all you got to do is just let your hand go, relax, and pull it out. But you won't do it because you think for whatever reason, maybe that you cannot, I can't, I can't, it won't work. I approach that, that mindset towards the whole idea of giving my life to Jesus. Man, for about a year ago, I was just dealing with deep conviction. I come so close so many different times, but I just couldn't let go. Just thought I had to have 
that old lifestyle, had to have that old world, had to have that old philosophy of living. This is the way my, my life is. This is what's going to make me happy. This is how I'm going to enjoy my life. Like a stupid monkey with my hand on the fruit in the gourd, I couldn't get free until finally I just let go. Can't live this way anymore. Don't want to live this way anymore. I need real life. This, I can't do this. And I, it's kind of like, God, I don't care what it takes. I'm sick of living this way. Let go. How many of you that are believers, gone back and put your hand back in the gourd? And it's got you. And you're in bondage. Hey, here's the question. What's holding on to you? I mean, there's a lot of people say, well, I'd love to let go, Pastor. I just can't find the strength to do it. It's not about matter of finding the strength to do it. Pull all day. I don't care how strong you are. Not get your hand out. You're not going to walk away from it. There is this issue where you literally surrender. You surrender to Him, which is the third strength point. It's the second statement. Read it with me. Freedom is only possible through... One more time. Freedom is only possible through God. It's only going to come through Jesus Christ. It's the only way it's going to happen. There's not going to be any other way. Let me read you the last of the story from and those verses, if you have, still have your Bible open. In verse 22 through 26, when the young man heard this, that he had to let go of his stuff... When he heard that, he was sad because he, he had great wealth. He had a lot of stuff to let go of. And Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it's harder for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven again. I tell you, it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were astonished. Why were they astonished? Because they thought anybody with such great blessing upon their life certainly had to be a child of God and a child of faith and a man of God, somebody who really pleases God because they know the Scriptures talk about how God will prosper those who please Him. But this wasn't somebody. God, you know, God calls it to reign upon the just and the unjust. That's a good reign and bad reign, all right? And here's what they said. Jesus, who can get saved then? He's done all these things, but give up his money, <laughs> which was the issue of repentance for the man who To you, he might be saying something else to go let go of. And when he heard this, they, that Jesus, here's the answer of Jesus, which is the third point. I tell you, gentlemen, with men, it's the whole thing about entering into the kingdom of heaven, having life, everlasting life. With men, it's impossible. There's not a one of us who can save ourselves, in other words. Not a one of us, no matter what we do, because good is never good enough. Well, then what am I going to do to be saved and have eternal life and get into heaven? Here's the rest of it. But with God, all things are possible. What are you facing today? Can I remind you, but with God, all things are possible? What are you dealing with in your life, in your heart, in your home, in your emotions? What are you dealing with? What's going on? What's, what's that particular thing, perhaps? That, that physical situation you may be involved in. Hey, you can't, you're not going to be free of it. But with God, you can be. But of yourself, you exclude God. You move him from the equation. It's not going to happen. Jesus tells the young man, come and follow me. Those are his two, last two words to him. Come follow. That's it. What do you need? Come follow. What is it for us? Come follow. Jesus said, anybody will come, on, will come after me, let him come. There it is. And let him, you know, deny himself. You got to let go. Take up the cross, embrace Christ, and follow me. How, how many people don't have that simple understanding of the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the simplicity, the profound wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we come, and then he does a work in us. He changes us. He empowers us. He enables us. He gives me what I need. When I didn't have it, when I couldn't do it, when it was impossible and I came, he changed me. And he changes everyone who comes to him. He touches your heart. He touches your mind. He gives you his spirit. You come alive internally. He fills your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. You become a new person in Christ Jesus. How glorious how wonderful, how great. No wonder they called it the good news. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
It's good news. Here it is, pretty simple. Good's never good enough. What are you holding on to? Come, it's possible through Christ. It's possible because of what Jesus Christ has done. On this table before me is a symbol and a very clear picture of what he has already done. Because he was good enough, he could accomplish it. Because he was spotless, he, became the, he could become the sacrifice. And he committed himself, and the sacrifice was accomplished. And for us, you know what that means? We come. It does require a commitment. You, you'll never do anything. You'll never be anything. Listen, you, you can sit around and know you've got to lose 10 pounds the rest of your life, but until you do something about it, you're not going to lose it. Amen? Amen? You, you know what you, some need in your life. You know what some accomplishment or some goal. And you, can, you can set goals until you're blue in the face, but if you don't get up and move towards them, Amen. you're not going to meet them. It's just not going to happen. We can make excuses why it doesn't happen all day long, but we really just tear away all the peeling from by around it, which really I just hadn't stepped forward. It's the same thing in your relationship with Christ. And it's the same thing if you are a believer in your fellowship with Christ. Amen. Come. Let go. Follow. It's possible. God's available. And he stands ready to meet you at your need. The Apostle Paul, when he's telling the church at Corinth about communion and about what this represents, he reminds them, you know, of what it really is. And he said, the Lord showed me this. In fact, that's the truth because Paul couldn't have read it from the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, because they hadn't been written yet when he wrote Corinthians. He wrote Corinthians before those were written. He said, the Lord showed me that the night he was betrayed that he took bread. And he, and he talked to him about what the Lord's Supper was and what happened that night. And then he tacked these words onto him. He says, so Corinthians, church, Christian friends, because of everything this stands for, and all this represents, the forgiveness, the redemption, the gospel message is all in similar. He says we should examine our hearts to see if we're clean before God, see if there's any wicked way in us, if we're not right with God, so that we won't come to this table dirty. We won't come to this table with things in our life, holding on to other stuff and trying to hold on to the Lord. He told the church you can't celebrate at the table of demons and also at the table of the Lord. You're going to fellowship one place or the other. So what is you holding on to this morning? Let it go. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, you've heard the gospel message clearly. That Jesus Christ, Son of God, came, died on the cross, and became the sacrifice for your sins because the wages of sin is death. He took your place and died your death. It's all, it's all moves forward from the grace of God and from the love of God, that God loves you that much that he would sacrifice his son so that you might have eternal life. He's waiting for you to come. If you don't know Christ, in just a moment we'll give an invitation. And when we do, there's going to be several men standing up here, and either one of us will be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus Christ personally. At the same time this invitation is going on, I want to encourage any and every one of you whom the Lord has spoken to today to pull your hand out of the jar. Let go. Come to the altar. Leave it at the altar. Commit yourself to Christ and follow. You say, well, I'm following the Lord, but if there's a but there, you're not following the Lord. You're following that whatever it is. All right? You understand that, don't you? We can come up with lots of rationales for that in our mind, but we know the Holy Spirit cuts right through our bull, doesn't he? Surrender. Come. Give your life to Christ. Let's stand together before we receive the communion together, and let's have a time where we're getting our hearts right before the Lord. You come today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, especially any one of us here in the altar today, we'll be glad to share with you how you can personally know Jesus Christ. Give your life to Him today. Those of you who know the Lord, what an opportunity to come. Get things right with the Lord today. Get it, get it before Him. Wash, be washed. Be made clean again. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we love you today, and we commit this time of inviting, of coming to you. May you be glorified with our responses today. May we learn, even in this moment, to just let go and let you be God in our lives. 
In Jesus' name. If we worship the Lord, would you step out and come at this time? Come. At the foot of the cross Where grace and suffering You have shown me your love Through the judgment you received And you won my heart Yes, you won my
You may be seated. As we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, again, hopefully you've dealt with the issue of examining your heart and responding to the Holy Spirit in the way that He's led you to respond to Him. I want to ask our gentlemen to come as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper together. We've talked about these elements on many occasions. I won't spend a lot of time today because we're familiar enough. But I do want you to know that each of these does represent something that Jesus put this word over each of them. Do this in remembrance of me. So as you gentlemen come, remember that today what we're doing, we're doing to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to exalt him. So push everything else out of the heart and mind. All right, everything else today will wait. But let's turn this over to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you, as we pass these out to these gentlemen, to take the, the element, the bread, and just hold it for a moment, and then we'll share it together after we have a word of prayer together. But most of all, as you're holding it, remember this bread, unleavened, pure, without sin, basically is what it represents. So was the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine just how profound that moment was in the upper room when Jesus took that bread from the Passover plate. Passover, they clearly was a celebration of freedom. This is clearly a celebration of freedom. But he let them know that that bread represented his body, which is about to be given. And the most profound part of that, just my own personal reading of that passage is, is it said when he took that bread, he said, it says he gave thanks. Say, so what's so profound? He knows that broken bread represents what he's getting ready to go through. That bread had to be scarred with 
cooked in a certain way so that the stripes from the oven appeared on it. It had to be prepared in such a way that the holes were visible in it. He knew what he was going to endure. But he endured it. Listen to me. He endured it because the Bible makes you go, he loved you. Let me say that again. He loved you. You may be a mess here today. He loves you. You may be pretty much walking this with the Lord, but still feel absolute condemnation half the time you're walking around. When will you get it in your head? He loves you. <laughs> he really likes you. He loves you. We're so hard to easy to miss that. So as you take, you remember God's love and Jesus' grace upon you. As we give thanks, Father, we thank you for sending Jesus because you loved us. We thank you, Jesus, for the ultimate sacrifice of expressing that love, that no greater love than anyone can have for their friends than they lay down their life. You laid down your life for those who weren't your friends. And we say to you, we remember you, Jesus, and we thank you. As you take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. It says in like manner that he took the cup. I'll ask you to do the same as this is passed out. To you today that you take this cup and just reflect upon the grace of God and remembrance of him. We'll take it together after we give thanks. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why? Because we're good enough, not good enough. But he was good enough. <laughs> because he was all the righteousness of God bound up in human flesh. Thank God for Jesus. Jesus, we come and we do take this in remembrance of you today. We remember who you are, Son of God. God in the flesh. Remember what you did. You lived a perfect life. You were obedient to the fathers. You went to the cross. You faced death and hell and the grave. We remember that today. And you rose victorious over all things. And now you sit at the right hand of your father and you are Lord. And we honor you today. And we take and we drink this today in honor of you and in remembrance of what you've done. Would you all take and drink?
Amen. Let's stand, sing that song, that last song you sang one more time, would you? Come on, sing it, church. be seated. We had a glorious celebration over the Magnolia campus this